Hello developers and architects and welcome to another video on building event driven systems. In this video today you're going to learn all about the cloud events schema and the importance of how you design your events. Now if you've been building event driven systems for any amount of time or you've been building any kind of computer system for any amount of time, you will have got to a point somewhere, somehow, where you've had to make a change. And that can get particularly challenging in event-driven systems because one of the core principles that you will often hear is that producers have no idea that consumers exist. So if you need to make a change to your event, how do you know what your consumers are actually using that event for, which feels... And one of the core benefits you will often hear when people talk about event driven systems is this idea of evolvability. And this is one of the benefits, of course, but you need to be incredibly careful with how you get there. If you've watched some of my last videos on public versus private events, you're probably already part of the way there. You've distinguished between events that are for your system and your domain and events that are for public consumption. But what if you need to make a change to them public events? And eventually, no matter what you think, you are going to need to make a breaking change to them events. So how do you manage that? Interested? That's what you're going to learn about in this video. Let's get into it. So imagine this is the event that you're working with. This is an order confirmed event in your system. You've got an order identifier, a customer ID, and an order value. And imagine at some point in the future, this order value needs to change. Your company has gone global and you need to start supporting multiple currencies, which means this order value field isn't really that appropriate anymore because it's a 125, 67 what? So you might make a change. You might say, okay, let's change that order value and we'll change that to be an object instead of a string and we'll make that value and then we'll put the value in there again to 126.70 and then we'll also have a currency field as well and let's say that is... GDP, the king's finest sterling. And now you've made that change and that's great for you, but what about all the downstream consumers? What about all the systems that you don't even know exist that you have possibly just broken? Now, of course, you could just add that currency property as an additional field. You could just change order value, order currency, and then you'd put GBP in there. That's fine. And in a lot of cases, you want to try and avoid making breaking changes wherever possible. But believe me, at some point, you're going to need to make one. And this is where things like the cloud events specification becomes really powerful because the cloud events specification is a specific specification for describing your event data. The cloud event specification gives you a high level schema for exactly how you should structure every single event across your entire organization. And if we were to take this event now and just clap fingers, this is what that same event would look like as a cloud events event. And you'll see right at the bottom here, this data section, you've still got the same event payload, order identifier, customer identifier, order value. What you're doing instead is adding all of this additional stuff. And it might seem like you're just adding things here for the sake of adding things, but there's a lot of really important and powerful things in here. The first of which, of course, being a type property. Now it's really explicit what type of event this is. This is an order dot order confirmed event. You've got a source which system published this event. And the source in this case includes the environment that this came from. So this came from the order system, the production environment of the plant-based pizza application. So now with them two things, you know who published this event and what type of event it is. You've then got the ID. The ID property is a uniquely generated identifier generated by the producer and it will help downstream consumers understand if they've seen an event before. So if you're building a consumer, you can look at this event and say, have I seen 1B8470ED-B6, so on and so forth. And if you have, you can just drop that event because you know that you've already seen it. Of course, the time this event was published, then you've got into some additional fields around distributed tracing. As part of the cloud event specification, trace parent and trace state are fields that you can populate. This allows you to easily implement distributed tracing because when you publish an event, you can include the trace ID and the trace state as part of the event you publish. And then consumers can consume that event and link the traces together. And in the next video, you're going to learn more about observability in event-driven systems. You've then got expiry time. This is an optional field. You don't have to include this, but it can be a really helpful one. If you're publishing events that are only going to be relevant for a period of time, let's imagine you're building a stockbroker you publish an updated stock price, that stock price is probably going to change at some point in the future. So you can, sell, you can tell downstream consumers if you see this event after 
1931 on the 20th of July. Please ignore it, drop it. There's going to be another one coming, hopefully. And then you've got the actual payload here. You've got the type of content this includes. This is a JSON piece of data. And then you've got the actual event data. So all of these properties up to here are going to be the same for every single event across your entire organization. The structure of your events are all going to be the same. And then this data section, of course, changes based on the type of event that you're publishing. Now, how does this help you when it comes to making breaking changes? And actually, what's what makes this incredibly helpful is this type field here. Importantly, this V1 on the end, because this will allow you to implement versioning in your event-driven system, much like you would version a HTTP API. Because let's imagine that same scenario again now. We want to change that order value to be currency and the value as well. So we could take that property, add the currency, again, it's GDP, and the value is going to be 127.60. And when we start publishing this event, incredibly, incredibly importantly, we increment the version number. And now you're publishing version two of your order confirmed event. And what makes this incredibly powerful is that right now today, you're publishing version one of your order confirmed event. And what you're going to do when you add this second version is you're going to start publishing version two, of course, with the new schema, but you're going to do that as well as publishing version one. So for a period of time, both events are being published onto your event broker. And then when it comes to your downstream service, as of right now today, they're consuming version one of your event. And over time, they're going to switch and start consuming version two. And because you've got this defined specification, you know that the schema that comes in at the top level is going to be the same. And you know that if the version number has changed, it's likely that the payload inside that data property is going to have changed. And now as a consumer, you have the flexibility to over time switch over to the new version of the event. And now it's really, really important as a producer that you set a depreciation date on the event that you publish. Otherwise, you're going to end up supporting version 1, 2, 3, 4, 10, 20, 30, because people are going to prioritize changing over. So when you add that second version, when you update your schema, ensure you set a depreciation date and you stick to it. The other really cool thing about cloud events is that there are a whole range of cloud event SDKs. This is just some .NET code here, but in the plant-based pizza GitHub repository that I'll link in the description below, there are examples of how to do this in .NET, in Node, and in Java. So all these SDKs exist to allow you to stick to the cloud events scheme. You see, I'm going to create a new cloud event here. I'm setting the type and the source and the time. I'm adding the tracing headers if I have an active trace. And then I can go off and format that event as JSON and publish it onto EventBridge in this case. And the same applies at the subscriber side. You can use Cloud Event in your subscribers to actually take that JSON payload that's going to come from your message broker and deserialize that into a Cloud Event. So here you're taking an SQS message, you're taking a message from a queue, parse that into a JSON object, and then use this JSON event formatter, which is provided by the Cloud Event SDK, to actually DC realize that JSON into a cloud event. And the really cool thing about this is that it will actually check your JSON that it meets the cloud event schema. So if you have people publishing events that aren't in the cloud event specification, that is going to start to error. And that is the same in Java. I don't think it's the same in Node, but Node doesn't have types. A programming language without types. What? Anyway, the cloud events specification. If you're building event-driven systems, ensure you adopt some kind of schema. There's also the metadata data pattern, which is another way of doing this that kind of predates the cloud event specification. But if you're building something new today, I would highly recommend having a look at the cloud event specification. And whatever you do, ensure you have a way to adapt to breaking changes. Because although an event-driven system gives you that evolvability in the way that your services integrate together, schemas of your events is the tightest bit of coupling that you're going to see. So make sure you have a way to manage that. Thanks all for watching. As always, I will see you all in the next video for more details on the fundamentals of event-driven architecture. In the next video, it's going to be all about observability. I'll see you there.